Today we're going to talk about Jack Valente. And so what I'm going to do is we're going to go through his Wikipedia first so you can get an idea of who Jack Valenti is. Uh, but ultimately, Jack Valenti was the shooter on the grassy knoll. And uh, we're going to go through over the next week or two, probably two or longer, um, all of the fine details of Jack Valenti's life. Um all the things that went into creating that person who pulled the trigger that day on November 22nd, 1963. And I wasn't really going to talk about the knoll itself today. I just wanted to jump right into the files. But I realized that uh, I can't do that. Um, a lot of people will not have been exposed to my work and uh, any of this information before. So... Um, we will cover it all, starting uh, at the beginning. All right, so um, here we are, Wikipedia. Wikipedia is fantastic, not because any of it's true, but because it's the official story all of the time. So if you ever want to know what the official story is, and sometimes even the official conspiracy theory, just go to Wikipedia. <laughs> So, Jack Valente, uh, born September 5th, 1921, died April 26, 2007, was an American political advisor and lobbyist who served as a special assistant to U.S. President Lyndon Johnson. He was also the longtime president of the Motion Picture Association of America. During his 38-year tenure in the MPAA, he created the MPAA Film Rating System, and was generally regarded as one of the most influential pro-copyright lobbyists in the world. All of that becomes very relevant um, when you come to understand that Jack Valenti was basically a lifelong CIA agent. Um, ultimately had to have been involved with the OSS during World War II because um, he did a short stint as a, allegedly as a bomber pilot. But we'll get to all that and uh, what I believe is his fake military record. Valenti was uh, born on September 5th, 1921 in Houston, the son of Italian immigrants. The son of Italian immigrants. That's funny. You know, I never read that before on Wikipedia. The son of Italian immigrants, because that is not supposed to be true. His father is supposed to have been born in America, born in Houston. Obviously, he wasn't, but I never thought that we'd actually see that on Wikipedia. But uh, let me move on. During World War II, he was a first lieutenant in the United States Air Force, uh, Army Air Force. Valenti flew 51 combat missions as the pilot commander of a B-25 medium bomber and received four decorations, including the Distinguished Flying Cross and Air Medal. Valenti graduated from the University of Houston in 1946 with a BBA. During, this, during his time there, he worked on the staff of the university newspaper, The Daily Cougar, and was president of the university's student government. Valenti would later serve on the university's Board of Regents. After earning an MBA from Harvard University in 1948, Valenti worked for Humble Oil. That's not true at all, but we'll get to that. Uh, Valenti worked for Humble Oil in its advertising department where he helped the company's Texas gas stations jump from fifth to first in sales through a cleanest restrooms campaign. <laughs> In 1952, he and a partner named uh, Weldon Weekly uh, founded Weekly and Valenti, an advertising agency, with oil company Conoco as its first client. In 1956, Valenti uh, met then-Senate Majority Leader Lyndon B. Johnson. Weekly and Valenti branched out into political consulting and added Representative Albert Thomas, a Johnson ally, as a client. In 1960, Valenti's firm assisted in the Kennedy-Johnson presidential campaign. So as you can tell already, Valenti was plugged in to some very important circles. In regards to him working for Humble Oil in 1948, that is absolutely false. He went to work for Humble Oil in 1936. 
when he was 15 years old. Why they leave that out here, I don't know. But we will cover that as we go through his FBI file. The fact that he had worked with Lyndon Johnson and President Kennedy on their campaign in 1960, I think, is very telling. It shows how connected uh, Valenti was to the president. Ironic, huh? <clears throat> Valenti served as a liaison with the news media during President John F. Kennedy and Vice President Lyndon Johnson's 19, uh, November 22nd, 1963 visit to Dallas, Texas, and Valenti was in the presidential motorcade. So, that's a lot to digest in that one sentence. Valenti served as liaison with the news media during President John F. Kennedy and Vice President Lyndon B. Johnson's uh, November 22nd, 1963 visit to Dallas, Texas. And Valenti was in the presidential motorcade. The fact that he was the liaison to the news media is extremely important because it was Valenti's firm, Weekly and Valente, who handled all of the publicity for the trip to Texas, including the stop in Austin. Um, and... Valenti did all of the booking of all the events that President Kennedy was supposed was spoke at and was supposed to speak at. He was also the liaison to the news media, meaning he controlled the flow of information surrounding the trip. And it was Weekly and Valente who released the motorcade route on November the 18th. That motorcade route, which allegedly Lee Harvey Oswald saw and then decided within a couple days to go and kill the president. Ultimately, a ridiculous story. But Valenti was at the heart of everything in regards to Texas. He sent the letter to President Kennedy inviting him to Texas in the first place to attend the Albert Thomas Dinner. Valenti's organization booked that event. Valenti, as we'll see, sat on the board of the Dallas Citizens Council, which was headed up by Sam Bloom, and it was the Dallas Citizens Council which ultimately determined uh, where Kennedy spoke. Kennedy wanted to speak at the Women's Building. I think we will talk about that another time. But it was the Dallas Citizens Council, of which Jack Valenti sat on the board with Sam Bloom, who determined where the motorcade went. Interesting, huh? The Kennedy assassination should be called the Jack Valenti Show. He was there every step of the way, in all of the planning. Hmm. Following the assassination of President Kennedy, Valenti was present at Lyndon Johnson's swearing-in aboard Air Force One and flew with him to Washington. He then became the first special assistant, in quotations, uh, to Johnson's White House and lived there for the first two months of Johnson's presidency. Hmm, interesting, huh? In 1964, Johnson gave Valenti the responsibility to handle relations with the Republican congressional leadership, particularly Gerald Ford and Charles Halleck from the House of Representatives and the Senate's Everest Durkins, uh, Dirksen. Valenti later called Johnson, quote, the most single dominating human being that I've ever been in contact with. Oh, I bet. <laughs> I bet he was. And the single most intelligent man I've ever known. In a speech before the American Advertising uh, Federation in 1965, Valenti said, quote, I sleep each night a little better, a little more confidently, because Lyndon Johnson is my president. I don't know if that's the exact quote. I think it was because Lyndon Johnson is in the White House or something like that. I think that's a little off. Um, Valenti later uh, attacked film director Oliver Stone for the 1991 movie JFK, called the movie a monstrous charade, and said, I owe where I am today to Lyndon Johnson. I could not live with myself if I stood by mutely and let some filmmaker soil his memory. So Valenti, faking outrage publicly over the JFK film, but he was the head of the MPAA who granted it a rating, and if he didn't want a movie to be made, it wouldn't have gotten made. Valenti was behind the making of the film. So it's hilarious 
that he would later come out against it. Same thing with the, um, was it The Men Who Killed Kennedy, the nine-part series on the BBC. Volenti came raging out against it, but really turns out he was uh, in contact with the History Channel the whole time they were making the damn thing. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, hilarious. Uh, MPAA in 1966, uh, Volenti, at the insistence of Universal Studios chief Lou Wasserman, and with uh, Johnson's consent, resigned his White House commission and became president of the Motion Picture Association of America. With Valenti's arrival in Hollywood, the pair were lifelong allies and together orchestrated and controlled how Hollywood would conduct business for the next several decades. Now, who exactly is this that they're talking about? They're talking about Lou Wasserman, right? And so Lou Wasserman, who exactly is Lou Wasserman? <clears throat> So, Louis Robert Wasserman, uh, March 22nd, 1913 to June 3rd, 2002. All these scumbags seem to live to be 90. He was an American talent agent and studio executive described as the last of the legendary movie moguls and arguably the most powerful and influential Hollywood titan in the four decades after World War II. His career spanned the nine decades from the 1920s to the 2000s. He started working as a cinema usher before dropping out of high school, rose to become the president of MCA Inc., and led its takeover of Universal Pictures, during which time Wasserman, quote, brought about changes in virtually every aspect of show business. In 1995, he was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom by President Bill Clinton. Several years later, he spoke uh, of his ongoing work at Universal to Variety, saying, I'm under contract here for the rest of my life, and I don't think they would throw me out of my office. My name is on the building. <laughs> um, Wasserman was born to a Jewish family in Cleveland, Ohio. A lot going on in Cleveland, Ohio, if you know what I mean. Uh, the son of Isaac Wasserman and Minnie Chernick, both immigrants of Russia, he began to show uh, his show business career as an usher in a Cleveland movie theater in 1933. He later became a booking agent for MCA, founded by Jules Stein. Under Wasserman, MCA branched out into representing actors and actresses in addition to musicians and in the process created the star system, which drove up prices for studios. MCA struggled to gain ground in Hollywood since major agencies like those belonging to Charles Feldman, Myron Selznick, and Leland Hayward had already grabbed up most of the major talent. However, in the mid-1940s, when it purchased Hayward's agency, MCA finally gained bargaining leverage with the studios. As an agency, Wasserman's MCA came to dominate Hollywood, representing such stars as Betty Davis and Ronald Reagan. Wasserman was an influential player and fundraiser in the Democratic Party, but was also a lifelong instrumental advocate, mentor, and close friend of Reagan's. Uh, the Newsmeet Power Rankings identify Wasserman and his close friend Jack Valente as two of the top five most powerful uh, and famous Americans whose campaign contributions uh, result most often in victory. Okay, this is extremely important because I say to people, Jack Valenti is one of the most important people in American history. And they look at me like they don't know what the fuck I'm talking about because they don't. No one's ever heard of Jack Valenti. And he's honestly controlled every single person's life uh, who is listening to this or watching this right now. He controlled Hollywood from 1966 to 2004. So if you consumed any media between that time period, you were propagandized by Jack Valente. <laughs> Ultimately. And Jack Valente worked for the CIA and he ran Hollywood from his office in D.C. Okay? So um, when you bring people like um, Lou Wasserman into the fold, you can kind of see how deep the... Um, it's not even penetration of the CIA into Hollywood. It's this overt relationship, Right? Uh, and the absolute proof of uh, Valenti's uh, employment by the CIA will, be, will become apparent. Uh, some idiot who released this file didn't know to re redact this one. And so we'll get to that either today or tomorrow, I'm sure. But um, yeah, so the point I'm making here with the, all this Wasserman stuff is that he and Valenti controlled Hollywood throughout all the time of your growing up, right? Unless you're like a teenager. <laughs> so um, crazy stuff, crazy stuff. And to think that Valenti was uh, so deep in the planning of the trip to Texas 
um, and ultimately the planning of the assassination. Uh, it's, it's unbelievable. And then after he leaves the White House in 66, which we'll probably get to like a week from now, he then goes on to run Hollywood with Lou Wasserman and control all the flow of media from D.C. to Hollywood to everyone's television set across the country and movie theater, right? All right, so let me go back to Jack Valente. The movie rating system. In 1968, Valenti developed the MPAA film rating system, which initially comprised four distinct ratings, G, M, R, and X. The M rating was soon replaced by GP and changed to PG in 1972. The X rating immediately proved troublesome since it was not trademarked and therefore used freely by the pornography industry uh, with which it became most associated. Films such as Midnight Cowboy and A Clockwork Orange were assumed to be pornographic because they carried the X rating. In 1990, the NC-17 rating was introduced as the trademarked, quote, adults-only replacement for the non-trademarked X rating. The PG-13 rating was added in 1984 to provide a greater range of distinction for audiences and was first proposed by Steven Spielberg. So, in regards to the movie rating system, uh, Make no mistake about it, it was a method of censorship because at the time, uh, if a movie came out, it could not get advertisement on certain um, uh, television stations or newspapers. It could not be pushed if it had a, an adult rating, if it had this X rating uh, or an, even an R rating, right? And so uh, these ratings came about to censor information that they didn't want you to have, things that were too politically oriented, things that were... Uh, you know, of course, it covered the, the graphic sex and the violence and stuff like that. But uh, in regards to messaging, uh, they censored a lot of films that were politically sensitive. And that was what it was really about in the first place. Restricting uh, the flow of information. Uh, Valenti on new technologies. Uh, during the late 1970s and early 1980s, Valenti became notorious for his flamboyant attacks on the Sony Betamax video cassette recorder, which the MPAA feared would devastate the movie industry. He famously told a congressional panel in 1982, quote, I say to you that the VCR is to the American film producer as the American public uh, and the American public as the Boston Strangler is to the woman home alone. <laughs> That's hilarious. I say to you that the VCR is to the American film producer and the American public as the Boston Strangler is to the woman home alone. <laughs> it's great. Obviously, uh, in hindsight, it wasn't, right? It was it was great for the movie industry. It added a whole other uh, secondary market for them. So, yeah. But Valenti wasn't really much of an original thinker. Uh, despite uh, Valenti's uh, prediction, the home video market ultimately came to be a mainstay of the movie studio revenues uh, through the 80s and 90s. Uh, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. In 1998, Valenti lobbied for the controversial uh, DMCA, arguing that copyright infringement via the internet would severely damage and, and uh, the re record and movie industries. Okay, so every goddamn step of the way, uh, Valenti is involved in censorship, Right. Through his, move, through his movie ratings and then through um, the DMCA, which he played a heavy hand in. Uh, and then this they won't mention here, okay? But uh, when you dig into Valenti, you find that he sat on the board of directors for the Recording Industry Association of America, the RIAA. And the RIAA actually was the backer of the PMRC, the Parents Music uh, something something, right? The censorship organization headed up by uh, uh, Tipper Gore and Al Gore who wanted to put labels on uh, on, on Slayer records, right? And uh, Two Live Crew and shit like that, right? So Valenti is balls deep in every goddamn major effort to censor people going back to 1968 when he created the fucking rating system all the behest of the Central Intelligence Agency, Okay. This is the this is how deep into the music and film and all that shit uh, the CIA relationship goes, right? Um, it's not just that they have to approve the fucking military movies and that's the backdoor connection. No, this shit goes way deeper than that. <laughs> uh, yeah, when you look into the RIAA, uh, he sat on the board of directors uh, of that with uh, Charles Bronfman. <laughs> fucking hilarious, man. Same people pop up everywhere, right? And these are the same people connected to sex trafficking and Jeffrey Epstein and now the Grassy Knoll, right? Um, in 2003, 
Valenti found himself at the center of the so-called screener debate as the MPAA barred studios and many independent producers from sending screener copies of their films to critics and voters in various award shows under mounting industry pressure and a court injunction uh, antidote international films Inc. et al. versus the MPAA. Uh, November 2003, Valenti backed down in 2004, narrowly avoiding a massive and embarrassing antitrust lawsuit against the MPAA. Always pushing the boundaries of that fucking pesky CIA. The Coalition of Independent Filmmakers, uh, Jeff Levi Hint, IFP Los Angeles Executive Director Don Hudson and IFP New York Executive Director Michelle Byrd said in a joint statement, quote, by obtaining a court order to force the MPAA to lift the screener ban last December, the coalition enabled individual distributors to determine when and in and what manner to distribute promotional screeners. It was viewed as Valenti's greatest professional loss. Uh, Valenti received the Distinguished Flying Cross and Air Medal for his service with the uh, Army Air Force during the Second World War. In 1969, Jack Valenti received the Bronze Medallion, New York City's highest civilian honor. In 1985, Jack Valenti received the French Legion d'Honneur. In 2002, the University of Houston bestowed Valenti an honorary doctorate. In December 2003, Valenti received the, quote, Legend in Leadership Award from the Chief Executive Leadership Institute of the Yale School of Management. Hmm, the Yale School of Management. What could be going on at Yale? Nothing shady, I bet. Uh, in June 2005, the Washington, D.C. headquarters of the Motion Picture Association of America was renamed the Jack Valenti Building. It is located at 888 16th Street Northwest, Washington, D.C., very close to the White House. Jack Valenti maintained an office on the 8th floor outside the MP MPAA's space until his death. <clears throat> in April 2008, the University of Houston renamed its School of Communication to the Jack J. Valenti School of Communication in his honor. Valenti was one of the school's notable alumni. Retirement. Val uh, Valenti's salary in 2004 was reported to be $1.35 million, which made him the seventh highest paid Washington trade group chief, according to the National Journal. Valenti was nominated for President of the United States by the Alfalfa Club in 2004. What a fucking joke that is. In August 2004, Valenti, then 82, retired and was replaced by former U.S. Congressman and Secretary of Agriculture Dan Glickman. The previous head of the rating system, Joan Graves, was appointed by Valenti. Okay, I'm going to say here, plain and simple, Dan Glickman works for the fucking CIA. That's all there is to it. They're not going to give up that, that power once they have it. Uh, after retirement from the MPAA, he became involved in technology-related venture capital activities, such as joining the advisory board of the Legend Ventures, where he advised on media investment opportunities. He also remained a supporter of causes linked to his Italian-American heritage, <clears throat> mafia, and was a member of the National Italian-American Foundation for more than 20 years. Uh, after retiring from the MPAA in 2004, Valenti became the first president of Friends of the Global Fight Against AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria, an, organi an organization founded by philanthropists Edward W. Scott and Adam Waldman. The founders wanted to support the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria in its work to prevent millions of people from dying of preventable and treatable diseases each year. Huh. Maybe Jack Valenti was one of the original goddamn funders of gainer function research. Um, under Valenti's leadership, Friends of the Global Fight oversaw a steady increase in U.S. funding for the Global Fund, resulting in a large-scale positive impact in the fight against AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. Uh, Valenti remained president of Friends of the Global Fight until his death in 2007. That's interesting and needs some further research. If anyone out there wants to do some further research on uh, that aspect of uh, Jack Valenti's life, I think it'd be a great place to start. Um, personal life. In 1962, at age 41, Valenti married Mary Margaret Wiley, who served on the staff of President Lyndon Johnson. They had three children, John, Alexandra, and Courtney Valenti, who became... I'm sorry, I can't, I, I, I'm reading this and I'm trying not to like burst out laughing because this is such fiction. Uh, who became a Warner Brothers studio executive. He died uh, just before their 45th wedding anniversary. Okay, so Mary Margaret Wiley uh, is the longtime and lifelong love of, of President Lyndon Johnson. Okay, all the goddamn Valenti's kids are Johnson's kids. All right, uh, it is a sham 
wedding. It is a sham marriage. Uh, Valenti uh, was a beard. Isn't that what they call it? Um, when he pretends like he's the he, he's the father and married and all that stuff, but really he's a he's gay and banging dudes uh, behind the scene like uh, McGeorge Bundy. <laughs> so um, yeah, um, that was what was going on there. We'll get more into that as we go through the documents because that pops up in the documents. So uh, Nancy Clark Reynolds had been a love interest of Valenti. Okay, so this requires I'm gonna have to right click and open link a new tab because that is going to need some immediate further research on my part once I get done with this show. Because there is a interview of a love interest in the Valenti files who is very important because they ended up not working out. And in the files, it says that it didn't work out. And she said that it was because they had a difference in because of their difference in religion. OK, so that I'm not going to talk about now, but we'll get to that further further on. But they don't. Her name is redacted in the files, so I'm hoping that this might be her, so I can do some research, and you know, I'll get to that. But yeah, that's why that's important. Uh, in 1964, the Federal Bureau of Investigation conducted an investigation concerning whether Valenti had a sexual relationship with a male photographer at a time when homosexual acts were still illegal in many parts of the United States. This investigation concluded that there was no evidence of Valenti being a homosexual. Okay. <laughs> If ever, if anyone has to ever state there's no evidence this person's a homosexual, they're a homosexual. Okay, that's how this shit works. Um, so this photographer, we'll get into. He's in the documents. Um, this photographer had some photographs <coughs> of Lyndon Johnson that the FBI freaked out about. Okay, and so we'll we'll talk about this more when we get to in the documents themselves. But ultimately, I believe that um, Valenti had organized some pictures to be taken of Lyndon Johnson. Uh, involved in some kind of homosexual acts and that this photographer was the photographer who actually took them. And I believe, of course, it was uh, some sexual blackmail because, make no mistake about it, Jack Valenti was Lyndon Johnson's boss in the White House. Okay? That's how that worked. Uh, in 1995, Valenti voiced himself uh, in the two-part Freakazoid episode, uh, The Chip, where he helped recount the origin of the titular hero he was also lectured about movie. He also lectured about movie ratings using stickers of a family and made frequent references to his cheeks. Uh, yes, uh, that's I have those clips. They're actually kind of funny to see Jack Valenti captured in a cartoon uh, in the 2016 film Jackie about the life of First Lady Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis after uh, Kennedy's assassination. Valenti is portrayed by Max Casella. Uh, Death, Valenti died from complications of a stroke at his home uh, in Washington on April 26, 2007, at the age of 85. He is buried in Arlington National Cemetery under a veteran's gravestone, which lists both his war decorations and his years as president of the MPAA. If that isn't a kick in the fucking balls, I don't know what is. His memoirs, This Time, This Place, My Life in War, The White House, and Hollywood were published on May 15th, 2007, a few weeks after his death. Uh, well, he's got a couple memoirs. He, uh, he's got uh, Speak Up With Confidence. He's got, uh, what was that first one called? Shit. He's got one that's got a weird psychedelic looking cover. It looks like it looks like fucking Putin on the cover. Uh, I actually have a copy of it signed from Jack Valente to um, Frank Church fucking score right bought it off ebay as a jack valenti signed uh first edition and i get it and i look at it and it's signed to frank and bethany church i couldn't fucking believe it it was frank church's personal copy the guy looking for the shooter on the grassy knoll had a hand-signed book given to him by the shooter on the grassy knoll the oh the fucking irony it doesn't get any better i wouldn't part with that fucking book for like less than 10 grand god damn what an incredible find uh, following his death, the National Italian American Foundation launched the NIF Jack Valenti Institute, which provides support to Italian American film students in his memory. Director Martin Scorsese launched the Institute uh, at the Foundation's 32nd anniversary gala after receiving an award from Mary Margaret Valenti. Uh, yes, and here's Valenti's books uh, Ten Heroes and Two Heroines, uh, The Bitter Taste of Glory. That's the one that I have. Uh, a Very Human President, uh, Protect and Defend, Speak Up with Confidence, and This Time, This Place. All right, so that's going to cover that. Uh, now, we'll get to the... All right, looks like I'm pretty good. So, uh, moving on. Now we are here. 
uh, in the Jack Valenti file, and I'm skipping to page 37. When you go through the first 37 pages, it's more modern stuff, post-2000, that has to do with the Motion Picture Association and a bunch of threats that they received. Um, they received a bunch of threats over some DVD cracking software, and uh, it caused a big stink at the time. I forget the details on it. Uh, it hasn't really been part of my focus because I'm not really concerned about Jack Valenti stuff that happened 30 years after the assassination, right? So... Um, but when you jump right into the file, what, what you first have is a page of redactions. There's a ton of fucking redactions here. Um, and who the hell knows why, but I, I'm telling you them, this is not in the JFK files, right? So this is a, uh, Jack Valenti file that is separate from the JFK files, right? So all the good stuff connecting to Kennedy, I think, is already out there. The remaining files all connect to Jack Valente through Charles the Blade Touring and through, um, who else? Uh, Harry Holler or Harry Hall. Um, those are the files. And David Morales, right? Those are the files that they're withholding that are important. They'll never release those. They released some of the Charles Touring files last year, and I read them, and they didn't seem to have any connection to anything I was... Uh, interested in at the time but i've still got like so many of the newer releases to go through um but jumping back into uh jack valenti's file the first thing you come across is uh an fbi slip that lists their known files on jack valenti and um other names possibly aliases of jack valenti but what we have here up top, uh, it says Jack, and then it has three case files. The first one, and I, I looked up all these codes. The first one, 29-20591, comes back to bank fraud, a bank fraud case. The bank fraud case, I think, is actually wire fraud, and I think that is the case involving Harry Hall or Harry Haller, because Harry Haller was busted... Uh, he's a CIA guy and a mafia guy. If you haven't noticed, a lot of these CIA guys are mafia guys also. It's just kind of how it goes. Um, he got busted with some White House stationery that had Jack Valenti's name on it. Uh, and he was using it to, like, uh, purchase weapons or something involving Cuba, right? And this is at a time while Jack Valenti is in the White House, like, sixty three, late 63, early 64, sometime around there, right? So that is the case I believe they're referring to. <coughs> this next one involving Jack Valenti... Um, is the White Slave Trafficking Act, okay, 31-40733. Now, the White Slave Trafficking Act, <laughs> this is um, this is crazy because I think this is more related to an abortion, right? So um, when you start to study Jack Valenti and you go through the files at some point, and honestly, I don't even remember where I fucking read this, but I read this in maybe even the file we're going to go over. But Jack Valenti was tasked with taking Lyndon Johnson's secretary, Mary Margaret Wiley, the one he eventually marries, um, taking her to another state to have an abortion. Okay. And I believe if I'm not mistaken, this kind of coincided around a time when uh, Jack Martin down in New Orleans was living in Houston also. And around this time, he became wanted for, this is in the 1950s, I believe. He became wanted for um, doing back alley abortions, right? So I'm kind of, my, my spidey sense is tingling because we know that uh, Jack Martin or who, or Edward Suggs or whoever was using the alias at the time was connected to all those folks down in New Orleans that we've already talked about, Guy Bannister, through Guy Bannister's office, right? Uh, so yeah, it's not a stretch. And, and we know that uh, Jack Valenti had to have uh, known Jack Ruby because, well, we'll get into that later on. Um, and so to stick um, Jack Martin into the mix here is not a stretch at all. Uh, it needs some further uh, research and follow up, but I'm kind of leaning in that direction. Uh, this last one here is a miscellaneous 62-9-19-331. And it says uh, top hoodlum. And then I, I honestly, I've looked at this like a thousand times and I can't determine what this writing is. Um, it says uh, top hoodlum and then field and then... Um, I can't read what that says. M, it looks like M-A-N-T. Who knows? I've looked at it a hundred times. I can't figure it out. But this, I believe, has to do with um, interviews with a top hoodlum in Houston who was known to associate with Jack Valenti, whom I personally believe uh, was one Joseph Lucia. 
I could be mistaken, but I don't think so. When you look at who the top hoodlums were um, at the time, and then you look into familial relationships, you'll find that the Valentes and the Caltagarones, and we'll get to Caltagarones later, and we've already talked about Calt Vincent Caltagarone on a previous show, but the Caltagarones and the Valentes, and even actually the Dinersteins, which is another interesting, weird, not coincidence, but connection, uh, because Jack Valenti's sister, Lorraine Valenti, will later go on to become Lorraine Valenti Dinerstein. She marries Ted Dinerstein, uh, I think, down in Florida, and then they move to Houston. But um, but anyway, uh, you have this like uh, trifecta of families um, that all were connected to a top hoodlum, and they were all attending his daughter's wedding in Houston back in like 1930-something or early 40s. I forget the exact date. Um, but it was Joseph Lucia, and in, in attendance was a Valenti and a call to Garone, right? And so um, that, to me, was kind of an indicator that this there was a tight familiar connection between Jack Valenti and uh, Joe Lucia, who was most certainly a top hoodlum and ran all the bookmaking in Houston uh, when that was actually active, because the Houston mob falls apart uh, in the late 50s. So... Uh, yeah, so that uh, that case, I believe, is that's what that's referring to. But there was an investigation in 1962, long before Jack Valenti goes to the White House, right? So he doesn't go to the White House till November 22nd, 1963. And then the FBI, like six months fucking later, then begins an, an investigation on him, right? Um, this is a year, this is before that. This is in uh, 1962. Um, and I'm not saying that because of the 62 dash case number. I'm saying that because I've read about this case separately. And it was a year before. And uh, why were they investigating Valenti a year before? I don't know, because they, there are no other documents that talk about that, not even in this file that we're going to go over. So below this, we have uh, the name Joseph. Remember, this is in the Jack Valenti FBI file, and this is from the FBI's file of criminal files on Valenti. And so allegedly Jack's, uh, Jack's name is Jack Joseph Valenti, but I have it on good authority that that's not his real name, uh, that his real name is uh, Joseph Valente, but that his middle name is uh, Malachi. And so, uh, but that we'll get to another time. I still need to go to Houston and pull his goddamn birth certificate. But uh, Joseph is his father, uh, Giuseppe Valenti or Joseph Valenti. So here I tend to believe that this long laundry list of crimes and files that they have under the name Joseph is referring to his father. And as I go through this, you'll see why. Um, the first one that pops up is a miscellaneous, and then you get into <clears throat> labor management relations. Okay, so um, I haven't been able to trace Joe Valenti to any labor stuff. Um, I there are there's really about two or three other Joe Valentis out there. It's a somewhat kind of common name in this mafia in the mafia world, right? So it's kind of hard to determine which one. And these guys also took advantage of this. These guys you have aliases of people. They, they use aliases of people they knew, right? So uh, in a situation where there's a half a dozen Joe Valentis, you know what I mean? Uh, they could be sharing backgrounds to obfuscate things. So who the hell knows? But uh, you have all these domestic security issues. You got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, at least, uh, plus the labor management issue. Then you get into... Something that says laboratory examinations. That's back then how that was uh, notated is probably um, something like fingerprints, right? Like they, uh, not necessarily a lab lab, but like uh, they had uh, fingerprints and they were doing something. That's how they would refer to it back in the day. And the same with research matters, probably something along those lines. Uh, then you have a bunch that are 92 um, dash numbers, which are racketeering enterprises. Okay. Then you have an unlawful flight, an espionage, and then a whole bunch of unknowns, miscellaneous. And then you have three case files indicated uh, by uh, number 61 dash 7341, 3176, and 7602, indicated as treason. And then you have a jury panel investigation. I'm assuming that's some sort of grand jury uh, with a 51 prefix. And then that continues. Uh, the last two here that are on Jack Valenti's um, list of case files uh, under the heading Joseph continued in 42... The case number 4212110-1 is for desertion. He was labeled as a deserter. And then 3902177, that's falsely claiming citizenship. So, 
that led me to believe it was his father, right? Which is kind of weird that the Wikipedia page would say he's the son of Italian immigrants because it was a big fucking deal that his father was uh, born in America. When you do the background on him, it's, he was saying he was born in Houston in 1897 or something like that. So maybe, no, 1896. So yeah, um, the the idea that Wikipedia would say that is, is to me is someone that this is relevant for. That's crazy. Um, but so, yeah, I'm assuming that all these are his father and not him under an alias, because if this fucking popped up and all this stuff um, as him directly, I can't see them uh, allowing him to proceed. Right. But then again, uh, I don't remember when this actually came forward. What year this actually was? Does it, have a, does it say on here anywhere? It just says twelve twelve. It doesn't have a fucking year. Um, so here I have highlighted. Um, this is fascinating to me, and I'm going to have to get into this another time. But uh, case number six three dash five three two seven dash A. It's uh, the case kind was unknown, and the the label here says Detroit News nine twenty nine sixty three. Detroit News, 92963. Well, that's the Detroit Free Press, if I'm not mistaken what it's called. I, I found this uh, newspaper on newspapers.com. And guess what I did? I read the entire goddamn newspaper to find what the hell they were referring to. And in that entire newspaper, there's one article that has any fucking reference or significance to anything whatsoever, okay? There's a reference to a guy an article referencing a guy named Trevor Gardner. Trevor Gardner was a former like top guy in like the air force or the Navy, or he was the head of the U2 program at the time, which was covert. And nobody talked about the, the U2 program at the time. Right. So, um, this guy turns up dead with no explanation at all. Period. To this day, you go to his Wikipedia page and it said he died this day. There's no, they don't even attempt to say how he died. But that is the only article of any relevance to anything in that entire newspaper. And then you have a reference to that newspaper, that edition, that date here in Jack Valenti's file under Joseph, which is his father. That's weird. That's weird. That needs further investigation, wouldn't you say? Could Jack Valenti's dad have whacked Trevor Gardner, the head of the YouTube program at the time? Fucking weird, right? I don't know the answer to that. All right, so let me continue on. Um, more of this uh, case file stuff, but nothing real. No indicators of anything there. All right, so here we go. We begin with some documents. I love these things. It's like uh, I see this and it's like, wow, it's a language I can understand. Date 12-13-63. There's even a handwritten note on the front that says uh, 12, uh, 1363 per Oaks, 79 cent later. To special agent in charge, Houston, Washington field office, Boston, St. Louis, and Baltimore. From the director of the FBI, Jack Joseph Valenti, SPI, booted uh, December 23. Booted, that's a code word. I forget what it means offhand. Um... Next, uh, White House has requested investigation of Valenti, who is a special aide to the president. Uh, he is four two-year-old Houston advertising executive who has been with the president since November 22 last. Attend grade in high school in Houston and graduated from U of Houston in 1946. I just have that highlighted be, uh, just as a, uh, this is like a bookmark point of reference. Uh, apparently attended U of Houston seven years, working and attending night school. Attendance interrupted by war service was in Army, Air Force during World War II as bomber pilot. After receiving a degree from U of Houston, went to Harvard School of Business for masters. In one nine five two, he and associate established advertising firm of Weekly and Valenti Houston. He also wrote weekly column for Houston Post. Uh, married President Johnson's former secretary, Mary Margaret Wiley, June one one nine six two. Wife and infant daughter are still in Houston, and he is reportedly house-seeking in Washington, D.C. So, this became interesting in my research. Um, 
I have a separate file with all my notes on Valenti, which I'm not going to go over here today or anytime soon until it becomes relevant. But here where it says that he, and if you'll notice, I filled in some of these uh, redactions and these redactions I filled in based on information I gathered that appear later on in the file. Like this last paragraph here, which we'll get to, like that appears word for word in um, later in this file. So that's how you know it was the same thing because it was unredacted in duplication. Uh, but here, June 1, uh, 1962, is allegedly when they get married. They allegedly get married in Los Angeles and then they go on vacation, honeymoon to uh, Las Vegas where they stay at the Tropicana, which at the time was owned by fucking, uh, who was it, Mo Dallas, or started by Meyer Lansky. Well, anyway, it was a mob hotel. And so his entire trip was comped. And so they do a big investigation into his, uh, <laughs> into his honeymoon stay, which is uh, pretty hilarious. Um, you really shouldn't do that if you plan on going to working in the fucking White House and you're covering for the vice president who just knocked up his secretary, right? <laughs> um, wife and infant daughter are still in Houston. And he is reportedly house seeking in Washington, D.C. Houston, C. Uh, you air tell June 21, 1962, captioned, quote, criminal intelligence program, weekly summary, end quote, which contains information concerning alleged relationship between Valenti and Joseph Lucia, top hoodlum is indicated uh, that informant has heard Lucia and Valenti had been very close friends and he was told that Valenti and Lucia had engaged in a homosexual relationship, does not know this firsthand, he had only heard it. So, that we will see coming up later on, virtually word for word, um, which is how I was able to fill in that redaction. So, that's how you were wondering. <clears throat> Um, to Special Agent in Charge, Houston, Washington Field Office, Boston, St. Louis, Baltimore. Uh, Jack Joseph Valenti, uh, booted December 23 next. White House has requested investigation of Valenti, who is a special aide to the president. He is a 42-year-old Houston advertising executive who has been with the president since November 22 last. Uh, attended grade and high school in Houston and graduated from U of Houston in uh, 1946. Apparently attended U of Houston seven years, working and attending night school. Uh, attendance interrupted by war service, was in Army, Air Force during World War II as a bomber pilot after receiving a degree from U of Houston, went to Harvard University School of Business for Masters. In 1952, he and associate established advertising firm of Weekly and Valente Houston. He also wrote weekly column for the Houston Post. Married President Johnson's former secretary, Mary Wiley, June 1, 1962. Wife and newborn child are still in Houston, and he is reportedly house-seeking in Washington, D.C. Uh, Houston, C. Uh, Urail, June 21, 1962. Captioned, quote, criminal intelligence program. Weekly summary, end quote, which contains information concerning alleged relationship between Valenti and Joseph Lucia Houston Top Hoodlum. Uh, it is indicated that informant heard that they had a relationship, blah, blah, blah. All right. So uh, then we come upon this article that was clipped from a newspaper. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and read some of it because all of this stuff is very relevant into the character development of Valenti and what the world thought of him and knew about him at the time that he was actually engaging in any of this stuff. Um, let me see. All right. So role in White House surprises Valente. So remember on November 22nd, 1963, uh, after the president is shot, uh, Valente makes his way to Parkland Hospital where he meets up with Lyndon Johnson. Johnson tells his assistant, Cliff Carter, get me Jack Valente. Jack Valente then meets uh, with um, Lyndon Johnson at Parkland Hospital. Uh, then Johnson heads from Parkland to uh, Love Field. Uh, then afterwards, after that, at some point, Valenti will then hop in a vehicle with Lem Johns and a couple other people. Um, and they tell this fake story about how they uh, race to get to Love Field. Um, but uh, that I will cover in more detail another time. Uh, so this is uh, Jack Valenti in an article speaking about how the his role in the White House surprised him, which it didn't surprise him because um, he told his partner um, Weldon Weekly two weeks before the assassination that uh, he was going to sell him his half of the business because he was going to Washington. 
All right, so role in White House surprises Valenti. Among the new people in the White House <clears throat> is a slight young man who has been seen walking several times with President Johnson. Visitors in the president's office also uh, have noticed him in the background ready to supply a figure or statement or whatever else uh, may be called on for. This is a uh, 42-year-old Jack Valenti of Houston, Texas, a World War II combat flyer who has become a sort of man of all works in the transition in the White House these days. Uh, if, if others are surprised at seeing him around the White House, Mr. Valenti is even more so in being there. It all grew out of a sequence of events before and after the assassination of President Kennedy. Invited on flight, Mr. Valenti, a Houston advertising executive, was on hand for the visit of the late President Kennedy and Vice President Johnson to Houston on the day before the Dallas tragedy. Mr. Johnson invited Mr. Valenti, a close friend for several years, to fly with him to Dallas, uh, period. Uh, after the assassination, Mr. Valenti came on to Washington and he said, quote, I've been here ever since. While he has been glad to be of any help, he uh, he, can to the, he came to the new president. Uh, Mr. Valenti's thoughts often turned to Houston. His wife, the former Mary Margaret Wiley, who was Mr. Johnson's secretary for nine years, um, is there. Uh, but what makes the separation even harder is that Mr. and Mrs. Valenti have a six-week-old daughter, their first child. The daughter is not surprisingly named Linda, L-Y-N-D-A, <laughs> okay? That is Lyndon Johnson's kid, Courtney Valenti. Um, friends since 1958. That's not true. It's 56. Uh, Mr. Valenti's uh, friendship with the president goes back to 1958. He was invited to coffee at the home of a friend who had arranged for Mr. Johnson, then in the Senate, to get acquainted uh, with some of the young men in Houston. Hmm. Sounds kinky, if you ask me. Uh, I thought this uh, was the most fascinating man I had ever met, Mr. Valenti said. The ties begun there were strengthened in the 1960 presidential campaign. Mr. Valenti actively supported Mr. Johnson's bid for the Democratic nomination. His firm handed, uh, handled the Democratic account in Texas for the Kennedy-Johnson ticket. The man who has found himself suddenly transported uh, from business pursuits in Houston to the busier pursuits in the White House uh, was born there. His grandparents came from southern Italy and settled in Houston about 90 years ago. <clears throat> I think that's false. Uh, he attended grade and high school in Houston, enrolled in the University of Houston, having to work. Uh, he went to night school, uh, worked at Humble Oil, that is, and after seven years, interrupted by war service, he graduated in 1946. I worked 15 hours a day every day, he recalled. My job was from 8 to 5, and I went from classes from 6.30 to 9.30. Uh, flew 51 missions during the war. He was a B-25 pilot serving in Italy with the 321st Bombardment Group of uh, of the 27th Bomber Wing. He flew 51 missions and received a Distinguished Flying Cross, the Air Medal with five clusters and a Distinguished Unit Citation. I had a meteoric rise in the Air Force, Mr. Valenti said. I went from a second lieutenant to a first lieutenant without any pull whatsoever. Mm -hmm. This whole guy's life was about pull. Uh, he came from the war to take a degree at Houston and then go to Harvard for a master's degree in business administration. In 1952, he and an associate uh, established the advertising firm of Weekly and Valenti. He also found time to write a weekly, I should say a weekly column for uh, the Houston Chronicle. So it seems to cut off a little bit there, but I'll pick it up here, uh, which happened to interest him. At the moment, he and Mrs. Johnson's secretary were married June 1st, 1962. Mr. Valenti expects he will be around for a while. He has put his whole business, um, which he says is not much, into a trusteeship. He is looking around for a small house to bring Mrs. Valenti and Linda here as soon as possible. Uh, stayed with the Johnsons. He stayed with the president and Mrs. Johnson at their home, uh, the Elms, until they moved into the White House. Now he is staying with friends. Mr. Valenti, like others in the White House, has no title. He does what seems uh, to need to be done if he has an office and interview didn't discover it. The interviewer didn't discover it. Um, Let's sit here, he said, pointed to two chairs in the corridor just outside the door of the office of the president's busy secretaries. Three times he was called away. In the rush of things, such mundane matters as whether he is on the White House payroll uh, have not come up. I think I am, he said, as he hurried away. All right, so... 
Uh, that is where that ends. The idea that he didn't have a title and he was working in the White House and the FBI didn't even begin the investigation to him for like month, was December December the 13th, like th two, three weeks after the assassination. It's wild to me. All right, so moving on. This looks like um, it's to Mr. Deloach, so it's FBI. Uh, from Mr. M.A. Jones, subject Jack Joseph Valente, special White House aide. Walter Jenkins of the White House staff called you on 12 12 63 and requested that we furnish him and the president an immediate name check based on information in FBI files concerning the captioned individual. Mr. Valenti is on the White House payroll as a special aide. Mr. Jenkins also requested that a full field investigation be conducted concerning Valente. The information in the Boo files, uh, Boo files, that's FBI files, I believe. Uh, in 1962, June 1962, a criminal informant of the Houston office reported that, I believe that to be Joseph Lucia, a top hoodlum and prominent gambler in Houston, was reported to have had a sexual relationship with Valenti. Uh, Valenti married uh, the president's former secretary, Mary Margaret Wiley, uh, when he was in the Senate at Houston on 6162. President Johnson gave the bride away. The informant alleged that uh, Valenti went to, let me see, blank, 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 um, went to the home of um, Joe Lucia and that he had reportedly had a sexual relationship with him or something along those lines. This is, we'll, we'll come across this information as we go through further through this document. Uh, this information concerning Valenti has not been corroborated by any other source and the informant stated it was not known to him as an absolute fact and that it was only told to him as having occurred. Uh, according to the files, Valenti has been characterized as a person who is friendly with gamblers, but has many well-respected associates in Houston. Okay, Valenti has been characterized as a person who is friendly with gamblers. Okay, this to me becomes significant and important when we try when well, when we when I try to connect Valenti to an alias in Cuba uh, and a guy who allegedly worked at the Capri who had a gambling habit. Uh, so yeah, we'll cover that some other day. Because <clears throat> Valenti had aliases and he was down in prison with uh, Traficanti down at Triscornia and like McWillie went to go visit him under the alias of a Giuseppe de George. But we'll get to that stuff another time. Um, let me see. The Washington Evening Star of 12 12 63 reported that Jack Valenti was serving as special aide to President Johnson and that he and Mr. Johnson have been longtime friends. This article. Uh, identified him as an advertising executive in Houston. Valenti graduated from the University of Houston, and he has a master's degree in business administration from Harvard University. Uh, he maintains a residence at uh, 2938 San Felipe Road in Houston. Uh, yeah, I looked it up. That's a 4,300-square-foot home worth $2 million today, or a year ago, or two years ago, whatever it was when I did this. Um, so, yeah, guy running an, article, uh, an ad exec firm, uh, ad exec executive at a firm and then he's working in the White House and he lives in a $2 million home. Mm -hmm. Valenti's alleged association with gamblers will be checked out in connection with the full field investigation that has been instituted. Uh, then it's all dated and stamped, all that good stuff. All right, so moving on. Another memorandum to Mr. Belmont. From uh, C.A. Evans, dated February 6th, 1964. This I found interesting because uh, Jack's real middle name is Malachi. And there's a bunch of references to to Mel in this document. And this other, like this is a weird one here, Jack Joseph Valenti. But you can tell that after Jack, something else was written and that they wrote Joseph over another name. Right. So I spent a lot of time in like uh, Photoshop changing the um, the contrast, trying to figure out what was under there, but I couldn't. Uh, so it is what it is. All right. Uh, as you have been previously advised during the special inquiry applicant investigation concerning Jack J. Valenti, special aide to President Johnson, our Houston office developed information reflecting that Valente had been a friend of longstanding of Joseph Lucia, Houston top hoodlum and leading gambling figure of the Houston area. Our Houston office has reported that information received from the Houston Police Department, Internal Revenue Service agents and a symbol informant of the Houston division reflects that Lucia has given up 
his bookmaking operation and will not carry on this type of illegal activity so long as his oldest friend, Jack Valenti, is working for the president. That where I put his oldest, that is also, again, referenced uh, here in these files, uh, virtually word for word. So action none uh, for information only. <clears throat> Walter Jenkins. All right, here we go. And this is the absolute proof that uh, Jack Valenti was a CIA agent, because you tell me if anything else makes sense here. From C.D. Deloach to uh, reference subject Jack J. Valenti uh, to Mr. Moore, M-O-H-R. Uh, Walter Jenkins called me from the White House at 12.40 p.m. today. He mentioned that the president planned to move several people in federal agencies over on the White House payroll. Captioned individual is one of these people. Let me remind you, Jack Valente is a Johnny-come-lately, Joe Schmo, friend of Lyndon Johnson, allegedly, works at his own uh, advertising agency, which handled uh, Johnson and Kennedy's uh, promotion for their campaign in 1960, right? This is what he does for a living. He's an ad executive. Now, let me reread this paragraph. Walter Jenkins called me from the White House at 12.40 p.m. today. He mentioned that the president planned to move several people in federal agencies over on the White House payroll. He mentioned that the president planned to move several people in federal agencies. The president planned to move several people in federal agencies. Several people in federal agencies, okay? <laughs> Am I beating a dead horse enough? Over on the White House payroll. Captioned individual is one of these people. Captioned individual is Jack Valente, okay? Captioned individual. Jack Valente is one of the fe of the people who are working in a federal agency who now need to be moved over onto the White House payroll. What other agency has front jobs? <laughs> none. Fucking none. Okay? Jack Valenti was a CIA agent. He was probably working with the OSS as a fucking hitman back in World War II uh, when he went off to do his alleged bombing missions that I can't seem to find any record of. Uh, and, uh, yeah, Captain Individual is in a federal fucking agency and had to be moved over on the White House payroll uh, on November. In November 22nd, or in November of 1963. So, yeah, he worked for the goddamn CIA. Duh. And when we go over a couple of photographs at the end of this uh, presentation today, uh, you'll see exactly uh, the, pro the, the further proof uh, that Valenti was, uh, in fact, CIA. Uh, Jenkins wanted to know if we could furnish to him and the president an immediate name check based upon the information in FBI files and then additionally conduct a full field investigation of Valenti. I told him we would be glad to do this. Jenkins told me if a full investigation had already been conducted of these people in the past, that he nevertheless would like to have them brought up to date. Action, the Crime Records Division is in the process of now preparing a memorandum based on the check of the FBI files. I will transmit a blind memorandum to Jenkins immediately after it has been approved here at the Bureau. It is suggested this memorandum be forwarded to the Special Investigation Division so that a full field investigation can be instituted in accordance with Jenkins' request. All right, new new, new uh, document to Special Agent in Charge, Washington Field Office, uh, Director FBI, Jack Joseph Valenti, uh, booted 12-23-63. Oh, booted is deadline. Sorry, booted is deadline. Um, Re Butel, 12 13 uh, Washington Field Office, secure comments of U.S. Senators from Texas R.W. Yarborough and J.G. Tower, it's John Tower, as well as U.S. representatives from Texas, A. Thomas and R. Casey, concerning appointee. And I, my own personal note is will likely appear later in the file redacted. Now, this is some really significant stuff here. Uh, as you come to understand Jack Valente, you come to realize that he had long-standing relationships with Yarborough, who was in the motorcade, and John Tower, and John Tower, who's connected to a story later on involving Gary Ween and information that um, is ultimately destroyed, which we'll, get, we'll have to get into another time when I do a show on Gary Ween. But Gary Ween's connection to John Tower in reference to the Kennedy assassination, this here, remember, this is not part of the Kennedy files. This Jack Valenti file is not in the JFK files. Fucking period. At all. 
it is not even closely re- it is obviously should be but it's not right so when people talk about the fucking files like fuck the goddamn files that they're holding on to you don't need them god it's so stupid all the good shit is in other fucking files like go through the mafia files that have nothing to do with kennedy and that's where you find out half the shit about the mob and their connection to kennedy <laughs> god damn these fucking people are idiots uh, but yeah, this stuff here is super important uh, when it comes to the Gary Ween stuff. Uh, when Gary Ween puts uh, what Melvin Belli and the company of like Menachem Begin and uh, Mickey Cohen and all these fucks in, in L.A. during the 40s, like great, great shit. If you haven't read the book on Mickey Cohen, it's, it should, it's a fucking must. Like you, you really, everybody needs to understand the role that Mickey Cohen played in L.A. and Hollywood and his connections to all these fucking people like Lou Wasserman that we talked about. All right, what is this? To director, especially in charge, Washington Field Office in San Antonio <clears throat> from SAC Houston. Read Jack Joseph Valente. Notice the circle between Joseph and Valente. You see that? You'll see that a bunch of times because it's missing a name. It's missing the name Malachi. Um, Jack Joseph Valente, SPI, booted December 23. Next, read Butel, 13th instant. Uh, eight home office indices indicate investigation conducted of appointee by Civil Service Commission in 861 Civil Service Commission S- serial number 2.2 3.6 2438 um, CSC request for Houston indices check listed him as Jack Joseph Valenti born Houston Texas 9521 relatives listed as Joseph Valenti Father, age 67, Josephine de George Valenti, mother, age 61, and sister Lorraine Valenti Dinerstein, age 38, all of Houston. Notice the name Vincent in the column that I've circled in red. That will come back to. But we've already talked about this when we talked about the Winterland Ice Skating Rink, right? Vincent being Vincent Caltagarone Jr., who was the former brother-in-law of Jack Valenti, who was married to Lorraine Valenti Dinerstein. Well, she went to become Dinerstein like later. Um, after 61, I think by 60 fucking three, I think she already married to dynasty by 63. So yeah. Uh, but she was divorced from Vincent in 61. This right here is stunning that they would leave this in the goddamn file. This is the FBI connecting Vincent Caltagrone Jr. directly to Jack Valente. Not that it was a big mystery. You can just go through the genealogies and prove it. But I mean, um, yeah, this is pretty goddamn significant right here because this connects to the Winterland and all that other stuff. Uh, Houston, okay, this is where I'm fucked up. And I haven't been able to crack this. I don't know what the fuck this is. Houston indices also reveal file on, and then it's all redacted, born, and it's all redacted. Okay? I don't know what that is. I don't know who that is, who they're referring to. I don't know of any other siblings of Jack Valenti in Houston. The other anomaly that I do know of is that in um, Missouri... There is another Jack Valente, born in 1936, and all it says on his tombstone is brother-in-law. Brother-in-law, if you recall, was the nickname of the uh, alleged conspirator when we talked about Carrie Thornley and Carrie Thornley's interaction with, what was it, uh, Gary Kirsten and fucking quote-unquote brother-in-law, right? So part of me is like, man, this is, this might be that other Jack Valenti. But this has Houston indices, right? But Houston indices just indicates that it was Houston who did the investigation, which means that when Houston did the investigation on Jack Valenti born in Houston, they might have stumbled across Jack Valenti who was born in Missouri, right? Go Google Jack Valenti 1936. You'll see this other Jack Valenti tombstone pop up that says brother-in-law on it. Fucking weird stuff, right? Synchronicity? Who knows? Do I see fucking connections everywhere? Of course I do. Are they really there? Who knows? Washington Field Office reviews CSC file on appointee and AEC file on redacted and set out leads by teletype uh, SA conduct appropriate investigation re-redacted. So at some point in here, okay, here's another thing. So there are obviously, there's no files on Vincent Caldergrown Jr. There's zero, like they don't exist. I should probably do a, um, a FOIA for him. If anyone out there knows how to do a FOIA, please hit me up because I don't know how to do them and it seems complicated. Um, but it just says Vincent. It doesn't have a last name. Meaning there's a level of familiarity to these FBI agents in dealing with this f- set of files, right? They didn't write Vincent Caldergaron. They just wrote Vincent and underlined it and connected it to the redaction of Lorraine Valenti Dinerstein. So why so casual? Why was the FBI so casual in their notation here? I don't know. 
All right, so that let me see. Uh, conducted probing investigation re redacted, uh, including redacted shown only as residing in Kentucky in fifty seven. Yeah, like that leads me to believe that um that they're talking about the other Jack Valenti here, because our Jack Valenti did not reside in Kentucky in fifty seven. But one thing you'll find in Kentucky, you know, what you'll find in Kentucky, and I don't know the year. Well, maybe I did know the year. I'll have to check my notes. But uh, I did find in Kentucky a. Uh, All right, here's another good one. I'm probably going to wrap it up on this, and then we'll go to some photographs uh, and some grassy knoll stuff after this. Um, to uh, Director uh, Washington Field Office from Special Agent in Charge Houston, uh, reference Jack Joseph Valente, spin booted December 23, next. Uh, Re Mitel, December 13th, instant. Um, okay, so whenever they say December 13th, instant, or something something instant it means like uh so here it would say december 13th instant means this year that would be the context um not referring to like a previous year when it says december 13th instant it means instant meaning this year um that instant can take on different connotations depending on how it's used but it refers to um right here right now uh this particular framework like all like now if that makes any sense. I don't know. After years and years of reading through FBI documents and studying their lingo, you kind of get a feel for what's going on. Um, all right. So directories and credit records Houston indicate appointee's sister has name of Lorraine Valenti Dinerstein. She was divorced from Vincent Thomas Caltagaron Jr. in June 61 at Houston. Um, correction line... Uh, five seventh word that uh, should be 60 that's uh, just a correction so yeah here's another indication but it's redacted vincent's name is redacted now how do i know it's fucking vincent because vincent was divorced from lorraine valenti dynasty in 1961 no unless she was married to two guys and divorced from two guys in 1961 uh and another guy has a name named vincent up in the column right so no it's fucking the same person as vincent Col thomas called to jr um who is the first cousin of mary boots roberts who runs the winterland ice rink who is aka joyce roland right <laughs> Oh, the fucking tangled web we weave. Um, all right, cool. Uh, I'll stop right there on the documents, leave this for tomorrow, and I will hop over to my notes. And I'm only going to show you a couple of things because I'm going to stretch this out over the next week or so. But in regards to the grassy knoll, I'm going to show you four photographs um, of key significance and... It's really the only four photographs you need to prove not only conspiracy, but to prove who was involved in the conspiracy and to prove that the shooter was Jack Valenti, right? So um, you have this photograph of the Secret Service car as it pulls into Dealey Plaza behind the limousine, okay? Um, I've numbered out the people here. The two people who are out of sight are Samuel Kinney and Emery Roberts, who are driver and passenger seat, right? But all these other guys here, it's Clint Hill... Uh, William McIntyre, uh, John D. Jack Reedy, and Paul E. Landis are on the passenger side running board. Then uh, number five, gripping the, <laughs> that's hilarious, he's gripping the front seat like he knows what's coming because he does know what's coming because at this point shots have already been fired. These guys are super calm for shots of having already been fired and we know the shots have already been fired because he's already passed the Alton's photo, which in the Alton's photo, you can see Kennedy's been struck in the throat and he's grabbing his throat. So we're already way well beyond that. Plus you have two people. You have a woman between three and four who's already diving onto the ground. And then you got this guy over here. I forget his name. Not uh, it's, it's on the tip of my tongue. I forget, but he's been identified. He's a construction worker. Look at him. He's jumping. He knows something's going on. He's about to run, but look at all these other fucking people. They're just calm as can be. Calm as can be, because everybody else in this picture, except for maybe Jackie, knows what's happening. So, um, from here, let me see. Um, two guys exit the Secret Service car. You have... Oh, and if you're listening to the audio podcast of this, I highly recommend that you go to uh, rockfin.com and go to my channel and uh, watch the visual on this if you haven't already seen it. Although, I've, I've, gone, I've done this presentation at least three or four times, and it's in my seven hour presentation on the totality of the assassination. And so, um, this is the presidential, uh, motorcade 
roster of people who were supposed to be in the Secret Service follow-up car. And if you'll notice, I crossed off two people, Dave Powers and Clint Hill, uh, because they are uh, they leave the vehicle, right? Clint Hill runs to the limousine, and then you have Dave Powers, who just gets the fuck out of Dodge because he knows what's coming. He for certainly knew what was coming. Because him and uh, Kenny O'Donnell were tight as can be. And Kenny O'Donnell was most certainly the key person connecting the White House to Sam Bloom, uh, which at the Daltex and the Dallas Citizens Council. So Kenny O'Donnell was in this fucking totally, completely and totally. His presence here in the Secret Service car prove it. Uh, but we'll get to that. So, um, so yeah, you got two guys left. So you had 10 come in, two guys left. So you, now you only have eight fucking people on the car, right? Um, and then let me skip a couple of these. I'm not going to talk about them. All right. So then we come back to this picture and now we're back to having 10 people on the car and the two additional people on the car are Jack Valenti and David Morales. Okay. Um, if you go through this, you can, you can easily identify everyone else who was in there. Samuel Kinney and Emery Roberts in the front seat. And then you have a uh, John D. Jack Reedy, Paul Landis who hopped in from the running boards. Uh, and then you have Kenny O'Donnell, and then 8, 9, and 10 are uh, Glenn Bennett, George Hickey, and William McIntyre. McIntyre is the only person who stayed on the side of the car. He never left the car, right? Uh, and it's George Hickey who has the AR-15 in the back seat. So, yeah, um, those eight guys who were in, who pulled into Dealey Plaza, other than Clint Hill, who's on the president's limousine, uh, and Dave Powers, who got out in Dealey Plaza, um, you're back to having 10 guys on the fucking car. And the two people they picked up were Jack Valenti and David Morales. Jack Valenti being the shooter on the grassy knoll, who then fled over the top of the knoll and was picked up by Greer on the other side. And then uh, we'll get into this tomorrow, but they do the leapfrog. And then here we go. He gets off of, uh, the, sec of the limousine, gets onto the Secret Service car. Uh, and here you have uh, Jack Valenti and David Morales on the side of the car and let me see here we go that's a close-up uh that's clearly david morales um so uh and that's clearly jack Valenti. i mean never in the history of kennedy research has there ever been such a fucking clear photograph of two people who are guilty as shit and shouldn't be where they are and that is on the side of the secret service car uh after having shot president kennedy um after dave powers gets out of the vehicle in dealey plaza uh, the guys who are on the side, it's John D. Jack Reedy and Paul E. Landis. They hop into the vehicle. Uh, David Morales gets on the running board in Dealey Plaza. As soon as Dave Powers gets out, it's the only time he did because he's already on the vehicle by the time they go through the underpass. And Jack Valenti is not there. Jack Valenti is then picked up and then he is driven from where? From here to Parkland Hospital where he then plants the magic bullet, which we will get into another time. Hopefully tomorrow. So... Um, that's going to wrap it up for today. We're going to be on Jack Valenti for about two weeks. We're going to go through his entire file. And it's some of the most important stuff uh, there is in reference to Kennedy. And remember, it's not in the Kennedy fucking documents. All right? So thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you guys tomorrow.